Matthew Picton's cultural mapping is on view in our artist project space through December 30th. And we are thrilled to have Matthew with us today. Um, he lives in Ashland, so he's not always here. Um, and I don't know, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background from my perspective on this, um, which comes from our members magazine, which is that, this is kind of my perspective on this, but to call his sculptural works maps is both accurate and a misnomer. His three-dimensional aerial cartographies are based often in a particular city or region of the world and feature layers of cultural references and historical text. Each work documents and invites us to explore particular times of societal and cultural change specific to that area of the world. For our exhibition, we have both Berlin, which is kind of a city piece that looks at Berlin's history for almost 50 years, I think. And then we have a, an even newer body of work that's really based on river systems in, as a unifying theme in some ways. So we have El Dorado, which is inspired by the Spanish search for the city of gold in the Amazon basin. And Apocalypse Now, references um, to Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad and the Mekong Delta. And then we have the Congo and all of its kind of bloody and horrible history, as I think Matthew will tell us more about. But Matthew was born in London and he studied politics and history at the London School of Economics. His work is in numerous collections, including the de Young Museum in San Francisco, the Herbert Museum of Art in Coventry, England, um, and um, private collections as well. I'm not gonna give you a long list of those. You can find those on our website. He lives in Ashland, Oregon, with his wife, Claire Burbridge, who is an artist and will be showing in another year here. And he is represented by Elizabeth Leach, and we're happy to have Daniel Peabody representing the gallery here today. So as I mentioned earlier, joining me today is Emily Shin, who is a second year graduate student in the history of art and architecture. Emily's been busy here for an, uh, the past year or so, research and writing all our masterworks on loan labels. And she is actually curating a show um, of Fernand Leger's Cirque, which is going to be on view um, starting in mid-November in our McKinnon Gallery upstairs and also will be giving a talk. And she's, um, if she has an essay in the catalog for Matthew's show, and I encourage you to read it, it's really wonderful. Um, so without more ado, we're going to, we together, not with Matthew, but Emily and I came up with a bunch of questions. <laughs> and then if we're not asking the questions that you think we should be asking. Oh, okay, sure. Then yeah. you can say, I think you yeah. should have asked me this. Right, okay. But um, so, so often we're used to having artists that have come through um, university programs and trained as fine artists. But Matthew's background is actually in history and politics and uh, literature and all yeah. kinds of other things. So I guess, when did you know you wanted to become an artist right. instead of a professor or right. something else? <laughs> um, well, I, it, it sort of happened in the last year of being at the London School of Economics when I was studying. And, um, you know, it, it initially came about because there was, a, there was a young friend who was going to art school. And I thought, oh, that looks much more exciting than what I'm doing. You know, just trawling through endless books, you know. And, um, and off he went. And I, I thought, you know, I, I could do it. I could have a go at that too. So I started painting, and you know, and it, it sort of it just continued. And eventually, after some years and some years of travel, I, I sort of got settled in San Francisco, in fact, and and really started pursuing it just bit by bit until eventually that was what I did. So really, I think more seriously from my age thirty, I was pursuing being an artist. You know, and, yeah. 
And um, building off of that, did you always work with paper constructions, or how did those manifest? Oh, no, I've, I've been through a variety of materials. I mean, I had my sort of horrible toxic chemical phase, you know, of nasty glues and resins and that type of thing. Luckily, far on the background, still alive, that's good. And um, prior to that, I'd, I'd used all sorts of materials. I'd used beads, I'd used... I, early on, some of the first shows I did in Portland were these taped surfaces where I would apply this double-sided tape and remove the surface of, of decaying buildings and present that as the artwork. And, and, and I felt that was perhaps the, the first sort of real body of work I'd put together that sort of informed future direction. So, so the, the paper has been, um, I don't know, probably like the last 10 years or so, mm -hmm. roughly. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so as we did with the exhibition, I gave this title cultural mappings to yes. your work. I mean, do you think that's accurate or yeah, how I, do you describe them? I, no, I think I think that's accurate. I mean, obviously there are different ways you could go about describing it, but it it is a it is a sort of uh, historical cultural mapping in many ways. It's it's, lo it's looking at the content of, of of that which has occurred in the sort of mapped context over different time periods. So, and they contain elements of culture inevitably so i think that's a, a good way of phrasing it jill that's good yeah. and uh what does the term sculpture mean for you um particularly in relation to the three dimensional the three dimensionality and or is it more nuanced um well to, to me i think anything that becomes more than just a two-dimensional surface becomes sculpture i mean you could look at my work as relief too <clears throat> because they're, they're typically wall-mounted pieces up to six inches deep. But the, the, the sculpture, to me, is about volume and sort of interior. And that, and that is where I feel that there, there is sculpture that is very much part of the work. It's a, it's a, it's a manipulation and, and dealing with material. And that is part of the sort of complexity of, of creating a sculpture is the, is the inevitable attention to how you're going to support, contain, cut, fill, whatever, with the material in question, as opposed to the, the two-dimensional photograph or, or, or painting. OK, so now let's turn to content. Let's right. turn to how you um, decide that you're going to do research on a particular oh, right. subject yes. and how you um, come up with the sources that you use for that. OK, right. Well. Um, I mean, it's a good question, and you know, there, there are there's sort of longer and shorter <laughs> answers to that one. <laughs> but um, for example, things th things can percolate for a while. You can, I can read something. Let, let's talk about the Congo. I mean, I read the Ghost of King Leopold, this amazing book about researching the whole of the history of Leopold's Belgian Congo. And I read that about five years ago, and that stayed with me. You're not going to forget that book, you know, and it sat there. I thought, God, and, you know, they would periodically rethink about that book until one day I start making a sculpture about the Amazon and the rubber broom period. And, you know, and of course that book's resurfacing as you're thinking about the other river on the other side of the Atlantic and thinking, oh, wow, that'd be really incredible to, to make this parallel sculpture about this particular subject. Mm -hmm. so, so that's an example of how, how you know, that there are always things that I'm thinking about or reading about or seeing a film about that, that, that kind of lodge in the memory that, you know, that, that are there to perhaps be explored at the right moment of development of, of an artwork, you know, which, which, you know, I can think about how I would want to create, for example, a sculpture of the Ganges. But I'm not quite ready because I don't quite know what the content is. I, I can imagine it, but I've found it. So I look sometimes and look at what books there are or what imagery there is, and I can think, of, yeah, okay, I know there's probably more, but so so we'll shelf that for a while, come back to it, and then something will appear, or I'll find something, or someone will tell me about something, and I think, oh, right, this could this we might be getting closer to actually making the sculpture now, you know. So so there's there's yeah. different things like that. Huh. Yeah. And um, with your sources and kind of connecting everything, how do you navigate between poetic or literary sources and historical fact and kind of creating a, a beautiful right. visual, but that's also that's a, Yes, a, that's, a, that's a good question yeah. too, of course. Well, so, so the first, first part of that is to make sure you're familiar with the, with the actual chronology and the events and the, the actual history. So I'll, I'll read around that some. 
But I'll actually be looking for something that, that has a more subjective view than, than, the, than the sheer sort of factual relationship. And so then it depends what you find. I mean, and I will look and um, find, you know, if, the, if there's any interesting imagery or, the, or some poetry potentially or some music that goes with it or whatever it is. It's, it's a case of, um, first of all, deciding that on the subject matter and second, inserting all of the sort of possible sort of um, explorations that have been done on the subject, you know. I mean, I mean, again, things can come to... I could think about, say, Istanbul or Hampamuk. You know, it's like such a, such a wonderful body of writing specifically about that city and so poetic, you know. And so... And there was a starting point to, re to read about his inspiration too, which was another Turkish writer in, a bit further back. And so that sort of informed that sculpture because it was quite inspirational to, to read that the, that, the very evocative sense of not just a sort of poetic sense of the place, but the actual sort of relation of history and, and what it felt like to be in the different decades. So, so if we're talking about some of these city um, sculptures and talking about one in the show, maybe you yeah. could... Tell us about Berlin. Like, what's in Berlin? Uh, well, the, yeah, the Berlin. I mean, I've done I've done two sculptures of Berlin. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and that that sculpture we've got here in the show, um, it's it's so so un underneath its sort of top layer, you can look through and see a map from 1932. And see, when you look at a map of Berlin in 1932, you cannot help but imagine the history and the time and the period and, and everything that befell Berlin during the next 10 to 15 years. Um, also in that, in that piece, that it's, it's divided by the uh, Berlin Wall at the time, so it's a sculpture of the city before the wall fell. And it's, it's create, the surface is created from two film, posters of two films, the Wim Wenders' Wings of Desire film, which was filmed in the, in the Berlin of the sort of the, the empty spaces left from the war um, before the wall came down, and then, the, and then The Lives of Others, which is a film about the claustrophobia of East Berlin, which takes up the other part of that, um, of that mm. sculpture. And there's also in the background there, there, there are some some elements of the the um, Berlin Alexander Platz, that some of the posters that went with that film, which was from a film that Fassbinder did um, in the I think that was in the eighties too. Oh. I should know my date, shouldn't I? But I've forgotten right now. But anyhow, um, I created a second sculpture just about the Berlin Alexander Platz in Berlin, which is a, a layered piece which had everything from the sort of imagery of the posters that were involved in the film to the to the, some of the stills from the film, and it sort of tunnelled inwards. And it was a very specific period focused on 1929 in, in Berlin, which was a kind of pivotal time in many that ways. That was one of the first yeah. pieces I ever saw of yours. That's right. That was, yeah, it yeah. was amazing. Yeah. It, it was a good one to get, yeah. that one. Can you I mean, talk about that one piece a little which one? The one I've just. The one, the one that is like drawn from the background. Well, that piece, that piece. So there were there were there were a set of portraits that were done that went with the went with the DVD, and there were paintings of of the characters in the film. So so sort of pivotal to to appreciating that sculpture is is actually um, seeing the fourteen hour Fassbinder film, which which is a film about the sort of claustrophobia of of. Um, Berlin and the society at the time, the sort of inherent brutality in society and the fate of the, the main character, the individual and his downfall as, as plays out during that film. And so, and so the sculpture contains in a sort of fragmented fashion um, images from the film and images, stills from the film and sort of has, has a sort of echoes of the forest where this gruesome murder takes place. It's also inside that sculpture as well. So. so those of us who saw the film when it came out, we would like spend the whole weekend. Just, you know, you'd watch the first section, then you'd have a That's short right. break, then you'd watch the next one. So you were completely immersed in yeah. that world <laughs> yeah. forever, which it's was... A, it's, yeah. a, it's a very claustrophobic one. Yeah. It's like a disturbing film, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and no yeah. one comes off well in that one. Nobody comes <laughs> off well in that one. <laughs> so let me just take you from that, because that's different in some respects 
than all the other works that are in the exhibition, which really, again, are united in some way with these, with water, with these river systems. Right. Yeah. So had you worked on river systems before? Or? Um, I have once. I mean, I, you know, like some way back now, I made all these Duralar sculptures of cities, and, and they were really just three-dimensional maps of given urban structures and their sort of layers and and at that time I did a few river systems they were they were they were again they were infrastructure they were the sort of shape of the river and, and then I'd overlay the roads and whatever other transport connections that would go with that um, geographic area but pri apart from that I haven't done any work on any of the rivers so, yeah. yeah and the themes of colonization do they, do they kind of connect with the river systems, or did those two ideas um, come separately? Oh yes, they they definitely connect with the river systems. I mean, I mean, obviously, probably anywhere around the world, and any invading force chooses the river to sail up, mm -hmm. and and because usually there's some civilization to plunder on the banks of it to start with, and so inevitably, you know, again, you sort of think about a river system, and you th and you imagine the the travellers who've come for whichever reasons over any centuries going up those rivers and sort of, th you know, so, so initially starting out on this Amazon sculpture, which isn't in the show here, um, I, you know, I started doing it. And, of course, within about half an hour of looking into the project, I thought, hmm, yes, the rubber baron era. And you, you find yourself researching the various sort of excesses and horrors of the period. And so, and so of course, the, uh, the, you know, the, the inevitable sort of thoughts of colonisation occur at the same time, because you're also reading about the further back parts of the history too. So, yeah. And I think if you take that then over to the Congo, maybe, I, I don't know that everyone here knows um, the history of the Congo that you're covering in your right. piece, which was... I mean, so horrific. Well, yeah, I mean, I can talk about that briefly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so the Congo, um, the Congo was was the site of one of Africa's greatest civilizations um, in the in the Katanga province, and and for a long time before King Leopold sort of turned his attention to the region, it had been being plundered through slave trade in particular. And so there had been a long history of people sort of meddling and sort of enslaving and sort of basically corrupting the, the sort of societal structures of this kingdom. And King Leopold stepped into the picture in, in the very end of the, of the uh, 19th century um, because he, his sort of... Um, Desire was to was to was to get something for Belgium, or really for him, and so he saw this as one area that that none of the other major powers have managed to get their grubby fingers on at the time. So through a very skillful process of sort of manipulation and playing off powers against powers, managed to it managed to become a Belgian sort of owned entity. The 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 vastness of the whole thing. And then from the next to 10 to 20 years, there was just wholesale plunder. There was, they, they estimated some 5 to 15 million people were killed, which was nearly half the population at the time. And there was just this flow of, of rubber and commerce flowing back to Antwerp. And it was, a, it was Joseph Conrad, but one of the people actually, who, who, who travelled there in that time and saw as eyewitness the, the true horrors of what was going on. And these reports started filtering back and, you know, and, and then there, there began to become a movement and people checking up on, on indeed what was going on and eventually you know, it came to light and it was stopped. Wow. Yeah. And then you... So... Maybe the second part of that question is like, what are the sources that that are in the work itself? And there are two works. Oh yes, well, there's, well yeah. So there's two. Yeah, there's two works. I, st I started making the first work, and because it's such a vast region, um, I, know, I, thought, well, I had to edit a lot of the rivers. You know, there, there was there's only a, in the smaller one. There's probably no more than a third of all the rivers at the most, right? And it, 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 it sort of bothered me. But I mean, what could you do on four feet scale? So. Eventually, I thought, I, you know, I've got to do something. God, it'd be so great to do the full thing, you know, 10 foot. And even then, I had to still miss a few small tributaries out because it's so vast. 
And in, and in the doing of that, that, that first smaller sculpture, which has a surface of, uh, which is a, a comic book novel about Mobuto Seizi Seiko's period of uh, rule, mostly. Uh, while I was finding out about that, I, I came across all the paintings that the artists in, in Zaire at the time in the 70s had made, which were a much more sort of oppositional body of work rather than this um, this comic book cartoon, which was done by this Belgian, who who seemed to it was it seemed like a propaganda magazine in relation to to the real truth of the time, and so having made one piece about Mobutu's rule, uh, I you know I, I felt like you really had to reverse it here. We have to go and show the show the the other side of the coin on the surface of the piece, and these are paintings mostly of the of the sort of period and assassination of um, Lumumba, who is the the first. Um, democratically elected independence leader of the Congo. And, and we kind of helped with that, right? Yeah, oh, yes. Yes, America <laughs> <laughs> has had a bit of a hand in that whole thing. I mean, you know, he, he was quite sort of outspoken about the sort of um, capitalist impulses, perhaps, of the sort of Belgians and, and others, and wanted to nationalise things and, you know, have little less to do with it. And obviously, that, that at the time, the obsession of communism was, was, uh, was paramount. And so America stepped in to sort of fund and aid a, uh, an alternative, and Mobutu was the, was the man at the time who was able to manipulate his way around the, the sources and get the backing and have, have Lumumba arrested and, and, and not so long away assassinated at the same time. So, yeah. And when you're kind of choosing your layers in which to, how, how close to the surface one, one source goes or how, very, how much you deep, how much you bury it. Um, is there a, a, a message you're trying to communicate or just different perspectives of history? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really trying to like, you know, hit the audience or anybody else over the head with a sort of particular message. I think, I think, that, I think the material conveys the message anyway. So, so I'm not, in terms of the layering and of any interior, there's, there's not like some sort of predetermined amount of uh, room given to to a uh, particular period so that we can be sure that this is the message. It's just, you know, it's, it's inclusive. It's like these, these are the, the layers of uh, history and perspective that, that existed, and this is how they've been portrayed by, by various people at, during the period, and I just include them. Hmm. Yeah. So then if we move over to the Mekong River right. and the two Apocalypse Now works, I, I like this idea that you've got these two um, pieces that relate, or you do one, and then it's like, oh, but I didn't do this enough. Right. I need to do that. Right. So yeah. can you take us through that process? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I mean, I started making a, a piece about apocalypse now because, um, well, having done the Congo, and of course, you can never forget the film Apocalypse Now at any time, and of course, it's all based on that history, really, uh, in the Congo and, and the Joseph Conrad novel. Um, it, it seemed that it would be interesting to sort of scroll forward into, into the 20th century and make a piece about Apocalypse Now. And so I was making one more specifically about the film in the first smaller piece, and we, well, I mean, so, so I, th I think during the making of that, I, I think I just felt the need to, to for it to for it to widen its parameters beyond something that was purely about the film. So, so the first piece is really pretty much purely about the film, whereas the second piece now incorporates bits of text from the Heart of Darkness, the wider geography of the Mekong Delta, and and the Viet Cong paintings that were done during the time as well. Hmm. So, you know, like, like any subject, it can, again, expand, and there's, there are more avenues to take, especially as you sort of look further into it. I mean, I'm sure if I look further still, I can find some more. <laughs> <laughs> Just seeing the exhibition you've got upstairs makes you think that. And that. Oh, right. Yeah, that's, that. that's, yeah. That's a, it's a great parallel, that. Oh. And, and that piece by Dean Q that, you know, which, was, which is about Apocalypse Now in the film, too. And right. the portrayals of between sort of fictional and documentary reality right. that that exist in that piece, and and obviously I've I've incorporated that perspective too 
in in um, in both those pieces because again there, there is there is this strong sort of cinematic portrayal of reality but it's a it's a fictionalized one and then there's a documentary one and then there's a sort of blurring and that, and that in some ways is comes through 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 our very sort of absorption of film in in culture over the last century because because they they have such a powerful presence they become like a living memory in a person and so mm. so the the imagination of whether it was documentary or not and as plenty of filmmakers who very cleverly have introduced documentary imagery into the fictional film and uh, and it's a great device of course so. No, that's okay. great. So Matthew was talking about um, the best we could do, the exhibition that we yeah. have in our focus gallery that um, is based on T. Bui's, um graphic novel. And we've got so many different perspectives on Vietnam, but when we realized that we were, your exhibition included Apocalypse Now works, then the, um, actually you'll see it at some point, but the guide that we have for students that are going to go through the exhibition discusses your work as well, even right. though it's not in that gallery, as well as Violet Ray's works on the collages. So yeah. we have these different periods that are pretty yeah. cool when they yeah, all yeah. come together. Yeah. It's interesting, and, and that intersection between <laughs> the two. Yeah. Have anticipated it. Yeah. But, hmm. um, so is it my turn or your turn? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as you're making a piece, I mean, right. how, how scripted out is the work or how much changes well, the, as you're making yeah, it? Yeah, that's, that's a good question too. I mean, I think, you know, if you think about the the sort of geography, well, it, it, that's fairly scripted out, like here's the form. Right. And is that from like an aerial view, or I mean, you uh, see a map, and then that's the lowest, yeah. the lower layer of yeah, that's the lower layer, or it sits on top, but that's that's the structure, mm -hmm. and the rest is in a sense hung upon that structure or hung within it. Um, and after that, you know, it, it's like, well, okay, so I start sort of figuring out how the layers are going to go, or the imagery, or whatever's being included. And, I, you know, I usually sort of say a third of the way in there. I, I believe I've got a plan of how it's going to go. And, you know, there it is. I'm thinking I can see it, imagining it. But until really you actually start kind of looking at some of it together, you don't quite know. And sometimes changes have to be made or in, in the inclusions or in the way the layers are done or in the coloration. And so it's not completely set in stone right away. And there, there are sort of um, accidents of sort of uh, reveal through the process, whether, like if there's a lot of chopped up sort of fragmented things, obviously that, that creates sort of a randomness as, as to what's going to appear while you do that, or if you cut into it or you don't cut into it. And sometimes you can, I can have a clear idea of how I think it's going to be, and I can get there and I can look at it and think, no, this is just not working out. <laughs> uh, okay. So all that work and... Um, and we, we had an incident just the other day where I was hurriedly trying to finish a big commission and the last bit and I drew out what I, what I imagined as to how, how I was thinking the, the surface waterways of the Bay Area were going to be going and, and I got it and I did it and I worked on it hard for two days and I, then I layered all the rest of the stuff up on top and I thought, oh no, I don't think it's working. <laughs> I thought, you know, I better as well go and get the proof of that. I better go and get Claire down here. So. <laughs> kind of knowing what was going to come, so I got her down. I said, you know, Claire, I'm a bit concerned that it's not quite working out. What do you think? So she climbed up the ladder and she goes, it isn't. There you go. <laughs> so that was great, you know, because I knew then that I was going to have to scrap that bit, right, and, and do something else. You know? and so mm -hmm. we talked about the possibilities yeah. and did a whole other thing, and, and there you go. And that's, it's, right. it's much better. And so sometimes, you know, that's how it goes. Yeah. But this, the, I mean, now that you bring that up, it's also interesting because you have, on the one hand, pieces that are following your own interests that you're pursuing that gel and you've got enough that you True. want to pursue. Yeah. And then sometimes some, someone says, now I want you to make this. Yes, and here's some money, right? What's going to turn that down? So, you know, usually, I mean, you can't, was, you have to. Because right? that's a yeah. San Francisco piece. Yes, right? it's, it's a piece about the, you know, I won't go on about it because we're not really focusing on that, but it's a commission. Uh, of, a, of a sculpture of the Bay Area, which is um, which is looking at the sort of social activism history of in the Bay Area. So it's actually an interesting project. But you know, it's like I'm I'm, I'm thinking, but but I was going to get onto something else, and now I've got to do this for the next two months. Oh, 
And, and that happens. And, and yeah. usually it's interesting because sometimes I get one of these commissions and I think, well, what am I going to do that on? <laughs> right, it's like, you're going to be kidding. I mean, there, there's no history there. I mean, it's like, we would be expecting to make an eight-foot sculpture of what? Right? And so there's the challenge. Well, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> How much are we going to kind of, like, ad-lib here? And, so, and usually, somewhere along the way, things surface, and an approach comes. And, and often an approach that will push the, uh, the material on the, and the, and the, the sort of... Um, width of the work in some unexpected fashion. So they're, they're good things to do. You know, you wouldn't want them every week, but... Jill, can we ask questions related to what you're asking him? Uh, you can, but I mean, I think because we're on a microphone, it doesn't come up on the microphone. That's the problem. That's why writing them down and me, one of us okay, saying so them... So if I ask this question, will you just ask it again? I will, yes. <laughs> okay, two questions. When you are exploring these rivers, do you ever go to the rivers? Have you ever felt drawn that you need to be on the river? That's question number one. Okay. Okay, yeah. do you ever feel like you need to be there to right. have oh, seen it in at. person? Okay. And question number two goes to the process that you guys have been alluding to, the art making process, which I'm having trouble understanding, so I suspect everyone would want to know this. When you create this body of experience, um, and knowledge of all these different layers of a place. Is each layer of that piece of art, as it's becoming a sculpture, laid out as a total piece, layered, and then you start to deduct from each one? Oh, that's it. Well, right, good question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's the process of yes. creation. And, right. and now that Patrick has yes. Apocalypse Now, Right. I mean, that may be an interesting one to think no, that, about. That, that could be a way of um, illustrating what you've asked there, Do you there, need to actually. look at it to so know we'll what be, we could, Well, we could, okay. I could show it from here, wouldn't <laughs> okay. I? And then, um, and then yeah. we'll give it back yeah. to you. And then I'll answer the first question. <laughs> the, the, the first question being, I mean, one, when I, I mean I, I've often been to the, most of the places I've done sculptures of, but not all of them. So it's not... 100% imperative to, but once I'm immersed in doing it, I'm, of course, I'm imagining being there, and and, and usually wishing it too. I mean, because I have travelled a lot and I'm always fascinated to to go. I mean, you know, they, any chance basically, but um, but it isn't completely. You know, I don't, I don't. Have, I have been in the Amazon basin. I haven't been in the Brazilian end, but I've been there, so I, I can for sure imagine the feel of of the, the wider basin. I mean, I've, you I've, go on the river itself? I, I've been on the river itself, yeah. I've been actually on the Rio Negro up there. But, you know, they're, they're not massively dissimilar at times, one to another. But, I mean, I, I would love to go to Manaus, of course, and see that joining of the rivers and all of that. Yeah. yeah. But um, back, back to the process here. So um, let's just see how we can explain this. So, so... In, the, in these in these cards here, we, we've got the, the the various layers, and you can see the very bottom of, of this sculpture. This is what there is now. Now, obviously, where these sit has been marked out through the holes in the top. So, so the the top layer, the top layer is um, this one. There's the top layer. So that so this would have been a, a whole surface, but these shapes have all been marked out between the rivers and cut through with an exacto knife so and then that would be placed over the next layer which is this one right i think i'm hoping we got it the right way up but let's assume yes there it is right so so these would then get marked out on a piece of paper placed over the top of this complete sheet of imagery and again the holes cut out and so forth all the way down holes becoming smaller and smaller and so the amount of of actual sort of imagery there becoming reduced each time until you got to the bottom part so and is each layer one kind of type of information yes e each layer is one type of information so so here at the bottom of the at the bottom of the sculpture we've got some text from the heart of darkness was that ever a full page of text no, no. The, the, yeah, the, 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 this is the, the text. Typically, the text is not random. So I, I have actually selected out pertinent elements that I feel to the sculpture, whether sort of 
descriptive or poetic or, or whatever it is. And so, so these have been specially selected out of the Heart of Darkness um, novel. And then, and then in this layer, I put my glasses on to see what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I up to now? Yep. So the, the, this is the Viet Cong paintings in this in this layer here. And then you have um, you have some more of the Viet Cong paintings in there. And in this one, images images from from the Apocalypse Now film that have been scraped with. Um, a s sort of squeegeed um, Copic inks, creating the stain across the front of those. So, so. And each yeah. one is built up. They're not just flat on each other. So you have the structure. Yeah. So if you had these pieces, you could actually create, in some ways, a miniature of Matthew's work. Well, yeah, you could actually, because you could, you could, you could buy one of the catalogues with, of the edition, <laughs> right? <laughs> And then, you, by putting some space, you could do this with magnets or pins or whatever else you could employ. And you could, you could situate these, you know, you can see, if you situate them about, about a centimetre apart. But again... No, well, we just realised that. We just realised. So, you know, I can't hold any more, but there's, yeah. there's three... Well, actually, it's the wrong way around, isn't it? Yeah. That one's the wrong way around. So there's, there's three of them. So you could, you could extend them, like, that far apart, or you could squish them together a bit more like that, and you'll have a sort of mini rendition of the, of the sculpture. And then the top layer, the top layer, this is, this is the participatory part of the whole project. <laughs> Where's it gone? <laughs> Where's the other... The is there one bit? more that's missing? There's what? So there's one more. There's one more bit, which is the, of the uh, of the actual sculpture itself, the red top, the whole thing. Oh, right. We're actually missing the page, oh, unfortunately. Maybe. But yeah, no, this one on. didn't have it. So oh, anyway, well, there's anyway, another layer. So there's there's one of the whole thing and, insert. Yeah. Right. So if and you look in here, right? Because we have it in yeah. here as a here it is. Right. So there's right. the red one. Yeah, there's the red one, which is a which is a solid page with no holes in it. In this. So if you pack, actually bought right? it, you'd get it all. Yeah. And yeah. then you could get you. <laughs> that's the top, but it's got no holes in it. So you you could get your own exacto knife and cut out through the red surface all the parts, and then you'd have it the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You could reconstruct the sculpture and you've right. got your it's own small of, version. But it yeah. it takes you through the, the kind Christmas of present. levels of research when you realize how much research is going into this, because they're all giving you different information That's right. about something. And, 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 and the beauty of having this, actually, is, is that you, you cannot have this when you buy the sculpture in a way. I mean, you can see sort of <laughs> in there, but you can't see. You know, it's all kind of partially sort of obscured or quite a lot obscured. So this actually provides the full reference of each end of the sculpture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And... So maybe I'll do one, and then yeah. you'll do the one about going to hear the talk. Sure. But um, so, so when you're doing this, I would imagine part of this is an aesthetic decision. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that happens at the very beginning or as you're going through it, but how do you, like, choose the connections between one type of... Um, Material and source right. as the, another one, like between comics and film or um, maps. Okay. Or um, well, well, partly it's what's available. Oh, I mean, okay. really. I mean, it's like how much choice is there? Sometimes there isn't very much choice okay. because there is there's a limit to the amount of material to find. Okay. And sometimes there's not all that much to find. So, therefore, you know, your, your choice is dictated there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the aesthetic part is is how it goes together. And, and how it's going to work as something that is more than just a documentation. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. okay. Um, and at your show at the Elizabeth Leach Gallery, and you gave a gallery talk in the spring. Um, That's right. And you, were, you had the Apocalypse Now was finished, and you were working on the new Apocalypse uh, Now yes, Mark II in the Mekong Delta. Yeah. And um, when did that sort of become more similar um, to the Congo, rather than more, rather than specifically focused on the film, and you sort of broadened out to the river oh, as a whole. Um, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think where I was up to at that point. I think, I think, really, once once the decision to to create a work that was 50 inches and took in like a lot more of the basin. 
You know, I, mean, I think really it, it's about it's about the width of geography by this time, and and I, I, at that time I had discovered this this whole book of all these paintings of the Viet Cong artists at the time. So so the, the, you know the, this this sort of wider context was already sort of in my mind as mm -hmm. to how that was going to go. So mm -hmm. yeah. And what about color? I mean, especially yes. when we're thinking about that piece right. and yeah. whether we're supposed to be thinking red as blood streaming down the rivers or I right. don't know. Right. Uh, well, it's obviously it's very evocative and, and the colors in any of them are evocative in different ways. I mean, to me, I thought, yeah, red's very evocative. You know, yes, of course, blood, yeah, you know, but it's also arteries, you know, it's like the rivers function as arteries too, as, as much as they might could be imagined as veins, if you're thinking about them being all blue, except in reality they're usually brown and muddy. Uh, <laughs> and, in the, and in this case, you know, the, the sort of the, the red evokes the arteries, it evokes the political turbulence uh, of the period at the same time, I think. And then the color of gold in the Congo well, and black. The gold, yeah, the Alterado. gold. Well, the gold in the Congo again. It's the, it's the, it's, it's about the material. It's about the, you know, the, 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 the grasp for the riches and the seeing, the seeing the basin as purely an economic resource, which is, which is really, is exactly what they saw. Mm -hmm. It was, it was. I, I feel it was when, when the early sort of explorers and the early traders and everybody else went there. It was, it was a place which had great fear in the imagination, whether of the local populace or of the vast gloomy forests or all the poisonous things and the snakes and everything. It was, it was a place of, uh, which inspired sort of bravado and braggadocio, I'd imagine, amongst the plunderers who went in there. And the plunderers were in there for economic gain. It, it, to them, it was just a hellhole. They'd rather be at home drinking, probably, than doing this. But, you know, it was it was a sort of place that that uh, manly exploits were um, were were sort of encouraged at the time, in a way. Yeah. So you've done three big river systems. Are there yeah. others? Are you thinking? Um, well, I, yeah. I mean, it's not you know not necessarily going to like just keep going river by river <laughs> till we get down to like the sort of Willamette or something. But uh, not that that wouldn't be a good subject. But um, I, I, I'm sort of percolating on the Ganges for sure. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm completely found on what I'm looking at subject-wise. So until that day comes, I shan't be doing it. But I am definitely thinking about it because it's got such a it's got such a deep and ancient history. And when I find what's needed, I probably will do probably the delta. You know, again, as a sculpture of the whole thing, it would, it's so vast and long and it, it would be hard to actually work it into a, into a sculpture, but with the delta, with the sort of density of form that you have in the Ganges and Brahmaputra deltas, it would make, it would, it, form-wise, would make a, a really great sculpture, just in, purely in terms of shape, so. Have you thought about a multi-part piece in order to do more? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, I've thought about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like you could do could the do. Ganges as an installation that, right. mm -hmm. that sprawled across, you know, some large wall space. And, and, and again, it's not, it, you know, I might end up doing it. We'll, we'll have to see, you know, it's, huh. um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'd like you to speak a little bit about how you expect viewers to read your work or to view the work. I don't Right. Um, but obviously, you can look at it from a, a distance, and you get uh, a magnificent in each right. uh, world domain. And it almost uh, requires you and pull in, pulls you into reading right. close up, really close up. That's right. I mean, uh, yep. you know, inches. And so uh, that's one thing that I find very interesting about the work. And the other is because it's sculptural and three dimensional. It does something which is uh, interesting. It it sort of pulls the rug out from under the viewer because you're looking at, at uh, what is an aerial view. Right. But you, the viewer is then in the air. True. You're you right. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. um, it doesn't. It's not like looking at a map. Almost, no. Which is two dimensional and yep. flat. And, right. And. Uh, that's, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how, how is a viewer approaching that? Uh, I, I mean, I think the viewer is, is initially, yes, exactly, feels the sort of, that sort of floating above it, aerial view, perspective, imagination of space, 
and sort of appreciation of it as a whole. And, and, and you have to inevitably, curiosity is going to demand that you get a bit closer to see what's inside it. You know, and as and as you become closer in, of course, the perspective is lost, and you enter the the history and the context in the inside. And you know, obviously, again, it, lots of things are obscured inside, but you can you can go forward, and and you can actually look and and read fragments and understand fragments. And I think I think it becomes a a um, again, it's it's sort of pre it it presents history in a sort of fragmented fashion which, you know, it's a sort of like a fragmented memory and you can see and glean parts of it, but you can never quite get the whole until you go back out where you lose the detail but you see the whole, so. Did anyone write any questions down? Okay, just checking. Yeah. Still have one more. Oh, yeah, there's, did you? Well, Um, Are you trying to offer any um, spiritual I, perspective? Right. That's a good question. Yeah. Hmm. Um, maybe ethical. Well, yeah, maybe ethical, spiritual. I don't. I don't think yeah, directly. Broad. It's a broad. It's a broad one. Like I think it's. I think it's. It's sort of subject related. You know. Like I think, with with again referring back to the possibility of a Ganges sculpture, that this would inevitably be part of that piece. It has to be because because that river occupies a, a, an essential part of the sort of Hindu religion in the area, and it has a profound spiritual significance. And so that any sculpture of that particular river has to inevitably be about that. I mean, I, I've considered other sculptures, like I've thought about potentially one day making a series of works about, about the spiritual centres of the world, which would be Rome and Lhasa, even though somewhat desecrated now, and others like that. And, and, and to all at Mecca, of course. You know, I, I've often thought about Mecca, and I still, you know, it's one day there will be a Mecca, and pro probably the day there's a Mecca, there'll be all the others too. And so all of those would have to contain um, mm. a spiritual component because mm. they would essentially be about that. But in, in the case of some of these other sculptures, there's not an overriding um, impulse because they, they weren't specifically geared to that, uh, that idea. And um, why the circular form for the oh, river systems? Well, that's good too. Yeah, circular. Cir circular. Um, there, there's several reasons for the circular forms. Circular form, apart from being a very sort of powerful and all-encompassing form, as as a sort of an artwork and it, and it with its with its sort of relationship to the sort of spherical nature of the globe. Um, it also it, it creates a completeness, whereas. Otherwise, you know, the, the, the forms, wonderful though they are, sprawl over, over large distances and becomes, in, in a sense, as a sort of framed work upon the wall, unmanageable. I mean, where does it start and end? You know, where, where, you know it, it, it's just sort of, it, it just sort of, the completeness is lacking. And so I, I, you know, you have to impose, you typically, and even in the case of the, most of the cities, there needs to be some boundary placed upon the, the extremities of the work. And, and the circular form is actually the most logical to well, use. It seems like it's a bird's eye view, yes, in a way, that that's you're right. looking through yeah. that. So yeah. it makes sense for that. And seeing that and knowing that Claire's piece that we had on view earlier was also kind of within around its shape. Um, do you find that you influence each other in any way, or are they so different in your practices and what you uh, do? Oh, I think we do, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, giving you specific examples is not easy, but we, we frequently conf you know, uh, confer or give uh, opinion okay. uh, upon what either of us might be doing. Right. You know, and so, and so there's an inevitable crossover just because of this sort of aesthetic uh, um, um, situation. You know, the, the aesthetic sort of like feeling or 
crossover of being next to another artist working in their own medium. And the intricacy you both and share the very intricate. Kind yeah. Of, yeah, that's right. That's that's very much a shared <laughs> thing. Too. Okay, here's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> Since some of your artifacts could be under copyright. Yes, good question. Have you yeah. had to seek permission no, from yes. others? Yes, it's, that, it's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good question too, that one, and it's one that is, a, is always a partial struggle because um, once someone threatened to sue me some years back now and, and it caused a sort of panic in, in me and, uh, you know, it was just it was a little bit of a struggle, that. And I realised, OK, so I started, you know, getting permissions for things. But the problem with getting permissions for things is that sometimes you don't get them. Sometimes you never hear back whether you get it or not. And sometimes it takes six months to ever hear anyway, by which time you, you're not going to now make the work because you, you haven't got anywhere with half... You know, like, like you could find six sources. You could get permission to use two of them. You could never hear back about two more. And you could, you could get refused by one of the others maybe one year after you'd asked. So it's like, you know... The trouble is, you'd be so bogged down with that that you'd you'd just I wouldn't be able to make any of the pieces at all. Probably, um, there is something known as fair use in the sort of copyright world. Fair use of material, and and that relates to sort of how much content you you're using. You know, like like there's something like under five percent is considered fair use. And, and as to how it's used, you know, a lot of mine is sort of fragmented or cut up or partially visible, stained or altered in some way. So and I think actually if you look at Mark Bradford's work, I think he's someone who's mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. considered that and has sort of scraped away at all the sort of uh, contained mm -hmm. imagery in, in his work because it avoids the issue of the copyright. Well, I think Richard yeah. Prince solved that one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> For many of us. Um, are there other questions? Anyone here? Yes. One, one more thought. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating, and we so appreciate this because we, most of us, have probably seen the work and then realized that there was so much we couldn't perceive and understand. And what I've come to under see today in this Q and A, this great Q and A, is that when you suggested that um, the viewer is in the air. And Jill said, bird's eye view in relationship right. to your sphere. What we got today was an archaeological, you took us into the deeper layers so that the things that we couldn't see, right. we might be able to read about intellectually, but, but that you took us down into a process where you're working from, we are having an experience here, Right. You were down here being yes. an archaeologist yeah, that's right. of ideas, and you're building up this way. And what happened today is you put all these layers together so that we have a very profound experience, which, by the way, is spiritual. Right. I, okay. I, I really think all right. that because of yep. the sense of opposite. Right. And, um, I, you know, and, and it's really great. For me, I when I was in with the work, I went... I need a magnifying glass. Right. I so right. want It would be a good thing. <laughs> a yeah. little bit more in that right. my age. Right. You know, like yeah, sure. It, it like yeah, oh, it might be a good thing. It might be a yeah. good thing but to have a few. So no, no, no. What? Kids, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could really kind of see every well, a lot inside with a with a magnifier. It's true. Yeah. And then, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a good so, thing. Yeah. Sir. Sure. Well, of course they are, yeah. Exactly. Yep. It's very, really subvert that there's no north, south, east, right. west. It's, um, and then this idea of layering that it's not simple, it's not a straightforward. History. Right. And do you, uh, is it really important to you to go to primary sources when you're doing your research and kind of uh, juxtapose those with like sort of the more eastern, the western, uh, European view? Of oh, yeah, if I can find it. Yes, definitely. I mean, it, it's a case of what can you find, and and in, and a lot of a lot of things. There's a lot of buried history of which very little record was was ever taken, and 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 I would love to find more of it. I mean, sometimes it's just it just cannot be found. Actually, can, in, interestingly, slightly 
I'm going to say this, but I have to, I have to do this sculpture um, uh, for a hotel in San Luis Obispo, and um, and, it, and there's, there's a limited amount of things to find about this, but we're very proud of their Chinatown, you see. So this obviously has to be part of the sculpture, right? And so I've looked and I've looked and I've looked, and I can't. I can only. I can find only one photograph of one Chinese person ever, right? In all the records that I've looked through, which is remarkable. So of course, my Chinatown in their sculpture is going to have no people in it, right? I think I might populate the rest with all the photos of antiquity. But uh, I mean, it's kind of fascinating. But it shows you how how. Again, how, how, you know, those that are in charge create, you know, they, they have their record of their history and others are invisible. So, you know. You can make it all with the same person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> There's just one person. They can make it all the way around. Right, right. right. Um, okay, well, please join me in thanking Matthew for sharing his process <laughs> and work with us. Thank you.